Because it feels like tonight he has to play well for them to win. He has sure. to play well. We, Booker's been playing well. DeAndre Ayton's been fine. Mikhail Bridges has been Mikhail Bridges. The bench has been the bench. But Chris is not the same player. D- take me back to where you were on Chris Paul a month ago and where you are today currently as he struggles. It really hasn't changed, Colin, because I feel as if not just a month ago, but if I look at this Phoenix Suns team, a Phoenix Suns team that had not been in the playoffs, never even made the playoffs for a decade. No matter what Devin Booker did, no matter what DeAndre Ayton did, no matter what they tried to do, they weren't a playoff team. And he's not only gotten them into the playoffs, he's taken them all the way to the finals. And it was he who got them there. Now, it took a very set, a special set of circumstances. Getting into COVID protocol probably ended up being a bonus because – It allowed him to have a couple weeks off, and the Suns survived. And then he gets, he needs a couple games to restart the engines because he is 36 years old. And then he finds his groove for a game seven uh, to close out the Clippers, and then ultimately a game one against the Bucks. But I'll go back to the fact that he's 36 years old. And it reminds me a lot of watching John Stockton, 98 finals against the Bulls if you go back and look at it had a terrific first game against the Bulls and then they just slowly but surely wore him down he was also 36 years old he was also an undersized point guard he was a guy that they exploited defensively much like the Bucks are doing with Chris Paul right now so I look at him as one of those guys one of the true leaders in the league capable of taking a very young Phoenix Suns team that had virtually no experience in the postseason and getting them all the way to the finals. And the fact that he's falling short now because he's up against a physical, uh, athletic, younger Milwaukee Bucks team, I'm not going to use that to downgrade what Chris Paul accomplished this year. To your point about moving forward, yeah, you know, it's it's tricky. You certainly feel better about paying him money for money that he's not going to be able to earn if it meant that he won you a championship. But if you take Chris Paul out of this equation, then the Phoenix Suns are not I I mean even with Chris Paul, they're most likely a one and done team getting to the finals. But if you take Chris Paul away, there's no replacement for that. Yeah. And so if you're happy with them being a playoff team now, they should be in the playoffs the next couple of years with Chris Paul. But are they going to contend for a title? I wouldn't expect that. You know, it, it is. we were talking about this yesterday, is that um, Nick Wright said free throw shooting's overrated, and we kind of laugh that, like, you know, LeBron struggles with it, Shaq struggles with it, Duncan struggles with it, Giannis is. A lot of dynasties and a lot of potential championships with it. But I think what's even more interesting, in a world of analytics in basketball, the seven teams that shot the most threes – one playoff series win combined. And the last three championship teams, Raptors, Lakers, and Bucks potentially, are not three ball teams. They're old, mm. they're big, they're physical. It's Serge Ibotka, it's the White Howard, it's JaVale McGee, it's it's Brooke Lopez. I'm not anti-analytics, but boy, the mid-range and ugly strong basketball. It's had a damn good three-year run, Rick. Has it not? It it well, you you're not going to replicate. You're not going to replace size. Size still matters. Being able to operate in the half court, being able to protect the rim, those elements still matter. And with the free throw shooting, you have to be able to get to the line. That's right. And if you if you look at the Phoenix Suns and and the Bucks, the Bucks, I, I believe Phoenix has only made like three more free throws. Than the Milwaukee Bucks because the Bucks just take way more of them, and whatever the lack of efficiency they have when it comes to at the free throw line or shooting overall, uh, the other part is rebounding and offensive rebounding. When you're only when you're limiting the opposition to one shot a, yep. tr- a, a trip, yep. and you are getting multiple opportunities. Yep. That sways that that's that has to be part of the analytics and the size factor for the Bucks has just been a huge difference maker in this series. And the fact that Devin Booker 
The big hole in his scoring game is he does not get to the free throw line. Yep. That's the downside of the mid range in that you're generally not going to draw a lot of fouls. So you have to be attacking the rim to make that happen. Yeah. And you also have to have the guile of a Chris Paul. Uh, Devin Booker simply doesn't have that right now. So he's taking 33 shots in a game and he's only taking five free throws. Yeah. That's that's a recipe for trouble. Yeah, and you know, we, we said this also is, and I don't think this is a small thing, Rick, is that one of the things we all know, and this goes against analytics, is that we know that the playoffs, the further they go, the refs swallow whistles. That's what they do. They always have. They This is why men beat the kids in the playoffs. Big, strong, 12, 13-year veterans. In the last three years, the Raptors got very physical with Golden State, and the Lakers got super physical with Miami, and the Bucks got super physical. And I didn't really think about this going into the series. But I look at it now, and I think I should have seen this, is that the way to combat the three and the finesse game and the perimeter game is you won't beat it in the regular season. But if I get to pay, play you seven times, we've seen yeah. it three years in a row. I don't have to hit threes because I'm just going to wear you down – and it almost feels like not. The, I don't know. Is it right to say there's a hole in analytics in basketball, and it's the way the game is officiated in the last six weeks of the of the sport? Yeah. Look, there's a tricky element to this because I do believe that the three point shooting was a factor early on in the playoffs. In the first couple of rounds, you could go and look at who was shooting the three best. I, I think it had a factor there. But as we move forward and the pressure heightens and you get closer to winning that ring, teams are going to play more conservatively. And to your point, you're going to be allowed to play a little more physical and the pace for the most part is going to slow down just because you're getting into 110, 115 games in a season, yeah. which is a level that these teams have never been to before. They've right. never had to play this many games and the games get harder and you get this pattern now where, you know, you're, you're not going to get suddenly a four day break. It's going to be two days maximum and you're playing the next game and you're playing against a team that knows everything that you want to do. So everything is a grind. And then it just comes back to that mental toughness, that physical toughness, and that ability to score closer to the basket. It's a lot harder to take those threes and know that it's going to be a long rebound going the other way, and that potentially goes from a three to a fast break dunk, and the crowd being back in the building, and the energy that provides if you're on your home floor. It suddenly makes teams conscious of, I don't know if I want to take this three. And, and I haven't looked at the analytics, but I would dare say, We've seen more corner threes being taken than from the arc because those corner threes are less likely to result in a in a fast break going the other direction. And and that's part of the consideration here. So uh, it's and, and the other part, too, is just the matchups for Milwaukee defensively. Yeah. Chris Middleton, Drew Holiday, Giannis Antetokounmpo. That takes you a long way toward making every three-point shot difficult for the Phoenix Suns. Finally, uh, so I did not see Space Jam with Michael, and I don't plan on watching this one. Uh, yeah. It's a kid movie. I don't think my opinion would matter. I've sat with my son <laughs> and watched enough movies, how he views stuff, and you know, I'll say stuff is insipid and dumb, and my son's like, this is hysterical. So I've given up on that. Like, you watch it, you tell me what you think. It is interesting, though. And, I, and, and Joy and I were talking about this yesterday. Now, once again, the Michael-LeBron comparisons come out, and Michael's looks better than LeBron's. And during yeah. the, during the uh, pandemic, the documentary not only got better ratings than the Lakers' playoff series this year, but when it went to Netflix, it's tripling the current NBA viewership. And it's weird. We're talking about Michael 24 years yeah. out of his prime and it, it, I don't know if it's dinged LeBron's legacy, but I don't see us talking about LeBron a quarter of a century from now. I mean, it just feels like Michael just keeps hanging around and poking LeBron in the ribs. His shoes will sell five times more than LeBron's next year. Still, right? Yeah, yeah. 
No, the greatest mistake that LeBron ever made, and I understand why he did it. I understand why he invited the comparisons to Michael Jordan, because who wouldn't? You want it, you come into the league, that was the standard. But LeBron James is not Michael Jordan. He was never going to be Michael Jordan. If he had done, which I, you see Devin Booker doing it now, don't compare me to Kobe. Like, don't do that. Don't take me there. We've had other guys who have said, don't like make those comparisons. If LeBron from the very beginning had rejected that and said, I'm not Michael Jordan, I'm never going to be Michael Jordan. I'm going to be my own guy. I'm going to be LeBron James. I'm a different kind of player. I'm a different kind of superstar. I dare say we might have appreciated him more for who he is. Yeah. But he invited it. And he's, I mean, he's contributed to it. Yeah. Don't do Space Jam 2. It, like you're inviting disaster here. In the looking back, everything always looks better in the rear view mirror. Right. And LeBron invited those comparisons every step of the way, and he suffered for it. He was never going to win those comparisons. So, um, you know, of all the brilliant things that he might have done business wise, the big the big caveat is the fact that he decided to put himself on this comparison plane with Michael Jordan, a game that he was never, ever going to win. Good stuff, Rick Buecher, Fox Sports. Good seeing you, bud. Game six tonight in Milwaukee. Thanks for stopping by. You got it, Colin. Hi, everybody. Thanks for watching. Subscribe here to get the latest from the show. Also, be sure to check out more of the best clips from The Herd or go watch a few segments from other shows on FS1.